So that's it, recording in progress. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. I'm Paula Lloret from the Working Community of the Pioneers, and this is our first EU Green Week event. Um, I would like to I would like to remind you that this is a hybrid event. So some of you are online in the location of your choosing, and others are like Sergio and Mikel, and in the are in the um, uh, Basque government delegation in Brussels. By the way, thank you very much to the Basque government delegation in Brussels for hosting us. Um, this event will take place entirely in English. Unfortunately, we do not have interpretation today and all questions will be centralized through the chat. So please refer there to any questions or doubts or comments or problems you may have. Um, without further ado then, I will pass the word to Mikel Anton, uh, our Secretary General. Welcome, Mikel. Thank you very much, Paula. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry about this delay, uh, some technical problems, uh, but uh, I think we have uh, already solved them. Okay, everyone, good morning, and thank you for attending this session that I am delighted to open as a General Secretary of the Working Community of the Pioneers, or the WCP, as it is known. The organization was founded in 1983 by the seven governments of the neighboring territories of the Pyrenees. Over this four, identity has evolved from its original status as an association to its now being a consortium. The aim has always been to answer the challenges of this cross-border community of mountains and coast. That is achieved by a partnership based on European community policy, particularly the territorial cohesion policy. The community of the Basque Country currently holds the rotating presidency. We are therefore pleased to be hosting this session at the Basque delegation, which is also being streamed live. My thanks go to everybody who is following us in one way or the other. The working community of the Pioneers has its 2018-2014 uh, 2024 strategy in place to improve the quality of life and the development of the Pyrenean region. The strategy mentions three key issues related to hydrogen. To hydrogen. The Pyrenean region has great potential to develop renewable energies such as biomass, wind, solar, marine, or hydroelectric power. The setting up of the scientific WCP in bioscience, biohealth, and energy within U22 and connecting the productive fabric with the different smart specialization strategies. Connecting Europe facility. The Connecting Europe facility provides funding to prepare and implement projects of common interest as part of the Trans-European Networks Policy in the Transport, Telecommunications and Energy Sector. Let me give a little background. Hydrogen is not an energy source, but rather an energy carrier. In other words, it must be manufactured before being used. In ways, and that determines its color. Thus, we have gray hydrogen produced using natural gas from fossil energy sources with CO2, which cannot or can or cannot be sequestered and stored, Green hydrogen produced from and using renewable energy sources by electrolysis, which do not use issue CO2. Hydrogen currently represents less than 2% of energy consumption in Europe. It is above all used to produce chemical products such as, such as plastics and fertilizers. 96% of that hydrogen is manufactured in using gas. That means huge CO2 emissions. The EU hydrogen strategy is exploring hydrogen's potential to help decarbonize the EU efficiently. The European Union will therefore earmark 1 trillion to the clean hydrogen hydrogen partnership between 2021 and 2027. This sum will be met by at least the equivalent amount of private investment. The development of the world hydrogen value chain offers a wide range of business and cooperation opportunities and also challenges for the private and public sector. That chain ranges from the production, storage, distribution, and use of hydrogen, along with other cross-cutting issues, such as training or developing legislation. However, the current geopolitical and political climate means there is a pressing need for the diversification of energy sources and energy careers, such as, such as hydrogen. This is necessary to make the energy system less dependent on imported energy and more change. More chain on international markets, climate change, lack of resources, and political instability in exporting countries. In the, in the Pyrenees, we have six regional strategies driving green hydrogen. There is also the Andorran Energy and Climate Change Strategy, as Andorra has pledged to the international community to be carbon neutral by 2050. 
We must also refer to the strategies of two member states of the EU, Spain and France. These are the French national strategy for development of low carbon hydrogen in France and the Spanish hydrogen roadmap, a commitment to renewable hydrogen. This set of strategies makes up a political and also economic policy framework. This helps the different stakeholders of the pioneers to be positioned in a paradigmatic territory in terms of territorial cooperation. And furthermore, to be an ally of the European Commission in the development of the hydrogen economy in Europe. In short, the aim is to be a key part of the implementation of the European Green Deal. That has been case from the moment it was inspired by the public-private partnership partnership principle, principle and by the subsidiarity principle that enables the practice of multi-level governance. The WCP presidency is giving new momentum to the Transpyrenean Hydrogen Working Group with a cross-cutting and comprehensive approach. That takes into consideration the whole chain of the H2 economy. In other words, hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, hydrogen distribution, applications of hydrogen cross-cutting aspects, such as training and safety legislation. Along with the Basque Energy Board, we are proposing to set up a steering committee. It will be made up of a representative of each territory and initially coordinated by the Basque Country, which holds the presidency of the, of the Working Community of Pioneers until 2023. Furthermore, the proposal is to establish three working subgroups and a meeting schedule. On 10 June in Bilbao, in person, we will be setting up the steering committee and subgroups. On autumn 2022, a steering committee meeting will be celebrated, also in spring 2023, and finally in autumn 2023. The three subgraphs will, run, will be run in parallel. The idea is for each one of to have the goal of creating a daily variable, mapping capacities, partnership areas, and cooperation protocol. To call the chair of the working community of the pioneers, Linda Karin Igurkuyu, the Basque Hydrogen Corridor is one of the great public-private industrial undertakings for the future of the Basque Country. An important partnership has already been set up in the north of Spain with the Ebro Hydrogen Corridor. Development opportunities are also being sought on the other side of the Muga, as the border with France is known. Our strategic location on the Atlantic Arc and the connection with France could open up the way to seek synergies with Nouvelle Aquitaine and Occitanie. If all the territories and communities join forces in the same direction, the achievements will be far reaching. It's going to play a key role in the energy transition. It allows both the energy potential of the territories to be harnessed and the decarbonization of the different uses. This includes energy production, mobility, energy for industry, and heating homes. The members of the working community of pioneers are convinced that this is a magnificent opportunity to provide an appropriate response to the challenge of the environmental energy transition. At the same time, the working community of the pioneers is becoming an important asset to serve the citizens of its territories. We are striving develop, to develop a shared strategy in the pioneers in the field of hydrogen from a cross-border perspective and following the logic of the EU's climate neutral targets for 2050. I hope that everyone finds this event fruitful and of great interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that interesting data and welcome, Mikael. To the working community of the, of the pioneers, hydrogen may actually seem like an alien topic. However, though, we have been working on it for a while already. And as Mikael just explained, uh, our presidency rotates among the seven territories that make up the CTP. So we are now under Basque uh, presidency, but until, 2000, uh, until, until 2023, sorry, and this work started um, with the Catalan presidency. Uh, Judith Stoll from the Generalitat de Catalunya is today with us uh, to explain it. Judith, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. I share my, I share my screen. Uh, okay. Yes? Yes. Okay. Well, anyway, um, well, as uh, Paula said, I'm Judith Stoll representing the Catalan government and particularly I'm here on behalf of uh, Albert Baibé, which is a member of the working group uh, of uh, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen from the CTP, that he will join this meeting afterwards at 11 because he was, uh, he was uh, busy at this time. 
Well, um, after that, thank you for uh, having um, organized uh, this site event, which talk, uh, which will talk about uh, really an important matter, which is uh, green nitrogen and climate action. And with a presentation that we have, uh, we will try to uh, explain uh, how important is the green nitrogen for our territories and economies and how we have arrived to this point. Why green hydrogen? Some years ago, we were talking about natural gas, then about electrification, and nowadays the focus is in green uh, hydrogen. In 2019, our government declared a climate emergency in Catalonia, so all our policies are being adapted progressively to compete with this statement. Now the climate emergency and, it, and its effects impact the world. In Europe, and therefore in Catalonia, drought, fire and floods are becoming increasingly common. We believe that green hydrogen is the alternative for the green, for the gray, sorry, hydrogen already in use in industry. Also, it is an energy vector to decarbonize other sectors. We are already in the energy transition. Energy has become a key and pressing issue to be tackled by the EU and all of us. Green hydrogen is also an opportunity for an economic point of view for European industry. Ensuring balance, green growth and competitiveness is essential in a globalized economy. Last but not least, a regional, with a regional approach generating our own energy and decentralizing large facilities is a way to rebalance energy production impacts throughout the territory. The Catalan hydrogen route map is, as uh, you can see, uh, runs in parallel to the CTP uh, route. Catalonia held the presidents on the, of the CTP for the period 2020-2021. It was also the time of the COVID-19 and all activities decreased. However, we work on promoting a study, a first use of case of green hydrogen. The Mobility, Accessibility and, connecti and Connectivity Working Group uh, from the CTP study potential uses of hydrogen in a heavy transport. Results were limited, but it was a first and useful step for the presidency that followed Catalonia. Hydrogen has a key role within the, currency, uh, the current presidency, LP uh, Basque Country. Uh, and in this matter, we are working intensively also with Aragon, Navarra, and the País Basque. Uh, the País what the Basque Country, sorry, I said that in in French. In addition, we are collaborating with our neighbors in the Pyrenees. That is a next step, but also a natural step. Uh, with this slide, we want to show that we have achieved already something, which is the Picasso project, which is led by the uh, L'Association pour de Competitivité Avenia, located in Pau in New Aquitania. And this project deals with carbon capture in the Pyrenees associated with the production of, uh, of hydrogen for transport. It explores the opportunities for reusing oxygen generated in green hydrogen production to make intensive heat industries cleaner. Also capturing, storing and reusing poor CO2. What we are doing in Catalonia? We have been working on green hydrogen since 2020, and it was then that we set up the Hydrogen Valley of Catalonia, integrating all the value chain and collecting a project portfolio. Expectation of the next generation fund, uh, funds impel us to make green hydrogen a key project. Therefore, working with companies and other stakeholders became an important part of our strategy as we look for funds to develop projects related to hydrogen. We know that we cannot do it alone. Our objective is to grow in order to have more impact. We are very active. In 2022, we signed the agreement of the Ebro Hydrogen Corridor. We work also with the other members of the CTP with Hydrogen Europe. And also we are observers in the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. As an example of Catalonia can do, these are our strengths. Barcelona is one of the most industrial areas in Europe, 
and Tarragona is the first petro petrochemical hub south of Europe. We have extensive experience in renewable energy and a first class knowledge and talent ecosystem. Geographically, we are in a strategic location for bulk hydrogen transportation, pipeline infrastructure, and hydrogen byproducts import export. Currently, we have identified 105 companies already working in hydrogen. Half of them are uh, small and uh, medium enterprises. We believe that, that uh, is a good point of a start. Here we have, uh, you can see the companies. Uh, as I said, there are um, 105. There are main energy producers and suppliers. For example, you can see Repsol, uh, Natuji, Shell, among the others. There are engineering companies working on storing and transporting industrial gas. And also there are end users in the fields of housing, heating and transport. The same applies for the tech and institutional partners who are an essential part of the ecosystem. You can see major universities and tech centers and the main institutions of the region. How do we manage and coordinate this strategy? The Catalan Green Hydrogen Strategy is mainly conducted by the Hydrogen Valley of Catalonia. In the Catalan Valley, there are over 20, 100 participate, uh, 200, sorry, 200 participating members representing the quadruplex helix of the whole uh, value chain of green hydrogen. You have seen, you see here uh, 144 companies, 41 public entities, 11 associations and clusters, and eight training and, uh, and research centers. Governance, awareness and promotions, and promotion, sorry, are done by makers, by members of the institutional and business promoters, which is our management team. After two years, the environmental reality has changed. So, so we are in the process of recalibrating the internal uh, system of management in order to uh, make it more participative. In this slide, you can see the main axis uh, on which the hydrogen ballet works. The first one, RDI and manufacture. Um, they are basically based in activities, RD activities, to generate knowledge and new opportunities. This one, uh, deployment, may, uh, the main activity is looking uh, for um, hydrogen solutions for identified use cases. And the last one, cross-cutting activities, identifies and performs cross-cutting activities, especially related to training and dissemination. In this slide, you can see a picture of some of the projects that we have in our portfolio. Those cover the whole, the, the whole value chain from the production of green energy to its use as uh, in the industry or transport. Also, the reuse of agricultural, agricultural and uh, industrial waste that's covered. We expect of over uh, 3,000 million of euros of investment that could generate almost 3,000 uh, direct jobs and 6,500 indirect jobs. In this slide, you can see the numbers uh, of the Hydrogen Valley of Catalonia, the investment in terms of CO2 reduction, employment estimate. Okay. Our international European strategy is to keep building and collaborating in hydrogen related uh, networks. We are already in some of the most relevant ones, but we do not close doors of anyone that is interested. It could be interesting for both parties. We are exploring opportunities to participate in projects to share good practices among other regions. Feel free to watch us as uh, all proposals are uh, welcome and we will be pleased to discuss them with you. Thank you, gracias. And uh, only uh, to tell you, here you have the contact of Albert Valle, which is uh, the member of the working group, and he will be with us at 11. There, if uh, you have some questions, you can ask uh, him directly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, 
We work on territorial cooperation in the working community of the Pyrenees, and we always have an eye in what's being done in the rest of Europe. That is why today we wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to learn more about the Clean Hydrogen Partnership. Alberto Garcia, who's project officer, will guide us through this program. Welcome, Alberto. Hi, thank you, Paola. I guess that you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Very good. But then, um, thanks a lot for the introduction. Yes, my name is Alberto Garcia. I work as a project officer within the Clean Hydrogen Joint Undertaking of Partnership uh, Program Office. And um, I will try to summarize a little bit the different uh, funding opportunities that we have within our program and also the activity that we have concerning regions or territories no? in view of this uh, cross-border cooperation that uh, it's happening in the Pyrenees and I'm very glad to be aware of. So first of all, who we are? We are a European Union institution in the form of a PPP, a public-private partnership. The public side of the partnership is composed of the European Union, represented by the European Commission, while the public, the private uh, side of the partnership is composed of Hadrian Europe, and Hadrian Europe Research, representing the industry and research grouping, uh, groupings working on Hadrian and fuel cells uh, in Europe. Our mission is to facilitate the transition to a green, and green European society uh, through the development of hydrogen technologies. And we do so implementing a research and innovation program as part of the Rise on Europe Research and Innovation Framework Program. The total budget within the program is uh, 1 billion euros from Rise on Europe. And uh, this um, quantity of this figure will be uh, complemented by a similar uh, funding from the private uh, members. Um, we are um, a partnership, as I said, although uh, you can also be uh, see that uh, we are referred to um, as um, joint undertaking, that's the legal name, we are the same, it's the Clean Hydrogen Partnership or joint undertaking. We are the successor of uh, the Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking Program, and we are continuing with the activities and the projects. And just to give you an idea, over the last 14 years, 15 years now, we have been supporting uh, 280 seven projects for more than 1 billion euros, complemented by the similar uh, funding from the industry and the research uh, groupings. We've been supporting projects along the hydrogen chain from the production, the storage and distribution, and uses also on cross-cutting issues, these transversal challenges that are also required to tackle for the mass market uh, commercialization of these technologies. And lately, we have been uh, supporting um, the hydrogen values, which is a concept which comes from the different uh, activity that we have with regions and territories and is having a, a very good welcome in, in many places. For those who are interested in the program, I would like just to draw your attention to two key documents. One, if, uh, one is the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda, or SLIA, in which uh, you can find the priorities, what technologies and what type of innovations we are going to fund over the next uh, couple of years. You, you can find this in the, in the website and I'll leave you there um, the, um, the link. And uh, then this strategic document, let's say, uh, it's implemented annually through uh, different work programs, in particularly this year, we published the work program 2022, in which, uh, let's say, we outline uh, the scope and uh, we provide all the details of the activities for the year 2022. Um, within the work program, of course, one of the major, uh, main activities is the call for proposals. And the call for proposals 2022, we have published it um, in March, if I'm not mistaken, and um, it, com it is composed of 41 topics with a total budget of funding of 300, a little bit more than 300 million euros is the biggest call that we have ever had within the JU. And I believe so that it's uh, the biggest call on hydrogen technologies at the European level. We are tackling um, all the hydrogen chain from production, storage and distribution, transport, uh, heat and powers and end uses, cross-cutting, two hydrogen uh, valleys, and one strategic research challenges. We are supporting innovation actions, research and innovation actions, but also support and innovation actions. Um, we have two deadlines um, within this call. One, it uh, had just expired, or we have met the deadline, it's, it was at the end of May. Um, and um, the second line it's uh, at the end of uh, the 20th of September. So for those uh, who are thinking of applying or submitting a proposal, uh, I'm afraid that the, the first deadline it's uh, already passed, but you still have time for the for the second deadline. In the, in the first deadline, we had uh, 26 uh, topics uh, within and for a total funding of 100 and uh, roughly 80 million. 
uh, euros. And uh, so far, uh, as I said, it is closed. And uh, we have received, uh, just for, you, for information, almost 80 proposals um, by the closing deadline, uh, involving more than or roughly 750 organizations from 49 um, countries. And just to give you a little bit of the appetite of the industry and the interest uh, from the, the different uh, sectors, um, the total budget requested for, from these uh, almost uh, 80 proposals is uh, about 700 million euros, which is much more than the funding that we have uh, available. But uh, it shows a little bit the appetite and the interest of uh, the European actors, let's say, uh, within um, this program. The second deadline, it's uh, still open. As I said, it involves uh, 15 topics as well, uh, tackling aspects of production, transport and distribution, and end uses and cross-cutting. And uh, I would like to draw your attention that also it includes the two topics on the Hadrian Valleys, which I think are quite relevant for this uh, cross-border co cross cooperation that you have in the Pyrenees. The definition of Hadrian Valley can be found in this strategic research and innovation agenda, this strategic document, and basically it's a, it's a geographical area, it's a region or a territory in which, uh, let's say, we can show all the advantages and the added value of hydrogen as an energy carrier. In that sense, normally it involves uh, big projects uh, with a multi-million euro investment, and um, normally they cover all the hydrogen chain meaning from production, storage and distribution, transport, and uh, the use of um, this hydrogen in different um, end uses. We have two topics uh, in this call. Uh, one, it's uh, dealing with a uh, focus on hydrogen value at large scale with a total budget of uh, 25 million euros. And the other one is a small scale with a small scale, a scale sorry, um, with a total budget of 8 million euros. In the, in the first one, uh, with the large scale, uh, I think it's quite a, a suitable indeed for this uh, cooperation in the Pyrenees because uh, the idea is to have a large scale uh, hydrogen valley, uh, but uh, not only in that particular region, but with interlinkages uh, outside these its boundaries. The idea is that the proposals should uh, make clear that the, the more than 5,000 tons of renewable hydrogen will be produced and uh, yeah, sustained by or supported by a guarantee of origin scheme, at least more, uh, more than two applications from more than two sectors involving energy, transport uh, and sector. While in the small scale, we are tackling just the production of 500 uh, tons of renewable hydrogen as well supported by a guarantee of origin scheme. And uh, in this case, uh, only one end sector application should be tackled. However, more than 20% of the hydrogen produced should be uh, delivered or used um, or consumed in the two main applications. In both cases, um, both values should demonstrate um, the, the added value of hydrogen in existing or new hydrogen markets. They should contribute uh, to the economic growth. Impact and replicability aspects are very important as well as <coughs> the commitment of stakeholders. And here I'm saying not just uh, the industry or public um, or, or, or private, um, sect, uh, private members or agents, um, but also from local or regional authorities. Something that is very important is the financing structure and the strategy for the business model. And um, in that sense, we do expect that these kind of projects, big projects involving production, distribution, and end use of hydrogen uh, will um, make use of uh, co-funding or co-financing. And in that sense, from the program office, we are happy to help. So in case you need uh, support, in case you need guidance to see how these co-financing and uh, co-funding schemes can be built within your region or with your uh, cooperation, please get in touch with us and uh, we will assess, uh, we will help you to, to, to find the best way to find different co-financing and co-funding uh, sources. <coughs> Also, uh, as part of the, um, the presentation, I wanted to make a brief overview of the different activities that we have uh, concerning territories. And I would like to start just by saying that we are working with uh, territories or regions since 2016, in which uh, we created, we established a platform for supporting regions and cities all over the Euros. We have more than uh, 90 regions and cities involved involved in that um, particular activity. That activity was um, 
was followed by um, a study um, for the regions and city, how to develop, develop business cases. It was launched in 2017. And then of course, the final report that you can find that I leave you there the, the link for your information. And based on this study, uh, two main initiatives were launched. One it was the, the creation of the European Hydrogen Valley Partnership under the Smart Specialization Platform in 2018, but also within the JU, <coughs> we launched what we call the PDA, the Project Development Assistant in 2019. And uh, this PDA, what we try to, to do is um, to help local authorities to develop the projects, to develop the hydrogen valleys, or to develop a hydrogen ecosystem within their territory, within their region or their uh, local ecosystem, let's say. To do so, um, we launched this procurement, this uh, public procurement, in which we selected 11 regions for direct assistance. The rest were invited to join as observers. And uh, we've been helping um, the different uh, local authorities to develop from the concept to have a uh, real project plans, how the financing and funding could be built around the project, and uh, to, yeah, to share strategies and best practices between uh, the different regions so that everybody can learn from the others. <coughs> Unfortunately, the, the PDA one, let's say, was finished last year. You can find the, the report and following the link. <coughs> and we have recently launched the PDA two. In that, uh, in this particular case, um, it is a focus on the cohesion of uh, countries and outmost uh, regions and island. And um, so unfortunately, I don't think it's suitable for the cooperation in the Pyrenees, but that's why I, I have highlighted in red this uh, section in which uh, we are also going to create an, a network of servers, which I think might be very interesting for you in case you want to learn from others, how they build their projects, how they fine tune, let's say from the concept to a real project plan. So I think it's very important, for, very interesting for you. And I would like to invite you to join the, the Observers Network and learn from others and see how other regions and territories are building their local hydrogen ecosystem. Something also that I think it's uh, very important, it's uh, this um, Mission Innovation Hydrogen Valley platform in case you are not aware of. It's a platform for all information on large scale hydrogen flagship projects, including hydrogen valleys. There you can find that in Europe, at least, we have identified the 23 hydrogen valleys in 10 European countries and the UK. You can have the different details. I've seen that the, in the Basque country, <coughs> there is already one valley, which I'm very glad to see. But not only the, the valleys as such, you can also find a lot of information about different platforms uh, to network, to work between uh, with the territories and to, yeah, to cooperate with other territories at the European level on worldwide and um, to replicate, let's say, the experiences and uh, learn from the, the best practices from others. So I'll leave you here the, the link as well in case you want, to, you, you want to have a look at it and to review all the information that it's available in this platform that we created in the context of the mission innovation. And last but not least, um, I would like to invite you as well that um, in, our, in our website, we have a specific um, section dedicated to territories. It's called FCH Regions Hub, in which you will find a lot of information, <coughs> which I think it's going to be relevant for your activities concerning hydrogen. Particularly, you will find opportunities for their PBA support or um, tools to support you on the development of business models, the different initiatives for networking or studies and reports. I think it's a wealth of knowledge and uh, this is publicly available for you to make use of it. And uh, with this, I think I finished. So I, just, I would like to thank again the invitation and um, yeah, I will give the floor back to you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto, uh, for this very, very interesting information. Uh, we have a question um, for, for the Clean Hydrogen Europe. Um, we, we have a Q&A section afterwards, but I believe you have to leave in a while. So if the rest of panelists are OK, I, I will address this question to you now, and we will keep it short. Um, so the question is, has the Clean Hydrogen EU EVA finance a cross-border hydrogen valley? Do you think that a cross-border approach may be relevant to develop and even to accelerate the hydrogen economy in Europe? Well, we believe that regions are uh, very important 
for the development of these technologies. And in that sense, uh, I, I tried to explain it in the, in the presentation, but uh, I think that the, the large scale uh, Halger Valley topic, it's very suitable for this type of cooperation because indeed it is explicitly mentioned that uh, it is not just in one region, but could be in different regions cooperating together. So in that sense, uh, as I said, um, we are we're supporting regions since uh, 2016, we believe that regions are essential for the mass market commercialization of these technologies. We are supporting regions from many angles, and particularly within the call 2022, um, we have this, spot, this uh, large scale halogen valley, which could be addressed by one specific region or several regions cooperating all together. So let's uh, so I would like to invite you to read through the topic and see if it fits. And if you don't have, uh, let's say, um, a mature or concept is not uh, mature enough, you can always join the different activities that we have to start building a mature project so that in the next calls, because as you might know, um, in the Repower EU uh, plan, now uh, the budget of the JU has been increased to 100 million to duplicate the hydrogen valleys in Europe. So we are going to support hydrogen valleys all over the lifetime of the EU. So <coughs> yes, I do believe so that the, the cross-border cross cooperation in the Pyrenees could be a suitable uh, valley in the years to come. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering um, so quickly. So, um, uh, well, before we continue, I would like to ensure that people in the Basque government delegation in Brussels are following correctly. If someone has any trouble or, or problem listening and, and following all the presentations, you can contact us um, by through the chat and I will be glad to try and, and help you. And well, now that we have this uh, European scheme, um, where is the working community of the Pyrenees in all this and where are all the seven territories? For learning about this, we have today with us uh, Sergio Pérez, who's external action general director from the government of Navarra, and he will address this today for us. Welcome, Sergio, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Paola. Uh, good afternoon or good, uh, good morning, everyone. Many thanks for, uh, for attending this webinar, this interesting webinar. And first of all, I would like to thank you, Alberto Garcia, especially for being with us uh, today. It's always a pleasure to learn about the clean hydrogen and uh, let's cross finger for having this cross-border hydrogen valley. Uh, for the community of uh, working Pyrenees, we will, of course, study the possibility of applying for that kind of funds and try to make the most of this cross-border cooperation. So thanks, Alberto, for being here. So as I stated, uh, we cannot make it uh, the different territories, the different regions that uh, we are part of the community of the working uh, Pyrenees. We cannot do it uh, isolated. We are doing uh, working together and we are doing in cooperation and coordination. But apart from being uh, uh, working in our homes or in our territories, uh, the governments uh, that compose this uh, community, uh, we are also part of uh, EU initiatives at EU. This is what we are trying to, to show or, or to explain in this uh, presentation. I don't know if you can share the screen, Paola, or uh, will I do it myself? As you prefer. Okay, can you can you uh, see the... Yes, we can. Okay, so this is the, the different initiatives. I will present the different initiatives that the some regions or uh, in some occasions, all of them, we are part of uh, at EU level and also why are we working in, on those regions, first uh, on those networks. First of all, um, I would like to talk about Vanguard's initiative. The Vanguard initiative, it's um, a network at the EU level that uh, regions, uh, we are part of that. Uh, because of our smart specialization strategy. And now uh, within the recent uh, modification or the recent impulse by the commission, it's the S4 strategies, which we aim to include uh, the sustainability uh, concept among the old uh, the smart specialization strategies. So now it's the smart specialization strategy and sustainable at the moment. So it is composed by 39 regions that um, we are divided into different groups, different pilots. Uh, no. Yes, sorry, Sergio, we, we see mm -hmm. only the the first page. Do you want me to share the... Okay, okay it's okay. Well, now we... Oh, 
No, I, I can share. I can share as you prefer. Now we can see it. Okay, um, apologize for the now. I think, yeah, this is the first one, the Vanguard Initiative. And as I was saying, is uh, we are connected by the, our smart specialization strategy, but now S4, smart specialization and sustainable strategy. It is composed by different uh, topics and by different uh, pilot projects, uh, such as uh, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, also healthcare, but uh, energy is one of our core business among the different regions that they are part of this uh, Bangers initiative. And at the moment, uh, recently has started some uh, discussions uh, if it could be a benefit for all the regions uh, that are part of Bangar to start a nitrogen pilot project, and we will see in the, in the near future. Another network that is um, that we are part of, it's the um, ERIN, uh, which is the European Regions for Research and Innovation Network. As you can see there, almost all the territories of the um, of the community of uh, working in Pitinis, we are part of that. ERIN is uh, the largest network for regions uh, that are involved in research and development and also in innovation. And there are 13 uh, thematic groups, which uh, one of those also is the energy and the climate change. And, the, and there's uh, different uh, working groups uh, focusing on the, uh, the EU Green Deal, also with the Fit for 55, the new legislative um, package uh, from the Commission, also uh, as being of uh, obviously the Horizon Europe is one of the main core businesses. So we are focusing on the clusters for the climate uh, change, climate change, and also in energy and climate. So uh, in that uh, network, uh, mainly the funds are oriented to the research and the development. Uh, this is another network that we are part of. Hydrogen Europe, maybe I will skip this part because uh, Alberto has already uh, explained it uh, much better than I can do it in, in, in this occasion. But uh, just to let you know to our attendants that uh, the regions of the committee working of Pyrenees, we are part of this Hydrogen Europe and especially for the Klein H2 partnership. So we are um, beneficiaries, or we could be potential beneficiaries of this call of projects that Alberto has already explained to us. Uh, so we can make the most of trying to explore or to inform our territories if we could try to develop this cross-border hydrogen valley, uh, that it will be the first in Europe in case of being funded. So we will explore, uh, obviously, later in our working groups that uh, the hydrogen group, working group is uh, leading by the CTP. We're also part of this uh, European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. This is a kind of uh, EU forum. This EU forum, the particularity is that there are a lot of SMEs, but not only SMEs, but also industries and CEOs from different parts of Europe. Uh, and it's a kind of a try to connection or trade of uh, an alliance that they are discussing different topics. Uh, hydrogen uh, uh, strategy for the EU, also mobility and um, uh, low, uh, uh, low emissions of uh, CO2. And this is a part of the industrial strategy for the Europe. So uh, this is another forum that we are participating again, the different regions by uh, ourselves or uh, represented by some stakeholders. There's a, another network that we are participating actively, which is European Energy Research Alliance. This is an alliance uh, which is the biggest one in Europe. It's uh, composed by 2,550 uh, um, universities and public research uh, institution, uh, institutes by 30 countries, by 30 member states, and it has 18 uh, joint programs uh, relating to the different research um, initiatives. Uh, one of those is the uh, hydrogen uh, batteries or uh, charge batteries, uh, and we are also part of uh, this alliance um, because we get some interesting information and some strategic information that we share with our technology centers and also with our universities. And finally, uh, last but not least, the European Hydrogen Valley Partnership. This is, uh, as Alberto has also mentioned before, this is the S3 platform, uh, which was previously managed by the by the GRC that now are managed by the DG Radio. Um, these platforms, uh, which uh, tries to alienate the um, uh, territories uh, with this 
strategy uh, managed directly by the by the commission um, we are happy because uh, we are uh, part of this and um, our partner or our colleague region aragon the government of navarre uh, of aragon is the leader of uh, this group in the hydrogen valleys so we are happy to kind of uh, this powerful um, community region leader in this uh, this s3 platform as part of the community of the Pyrenees. So uh, to sum up with, we are part of different EU initiatives, different networks, uh, all of them related to the hydrogen and the climate change. And this is the main ones or the core ones, uh, which the main objective of this uh, short presentation was to uh, let you know that we have a EU intensive and active EU activity, not only in our regions, not only in France and Spain uh, in this cross-border territory, but also at a EU level. And I hope this uh, finds you well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. And uh, sorry for the misunderstandings with the uh, screen sharing. Um, so let's continue with the with the agenda today, as we have a short delay of 10 minutes. The Pyrenees is a very interesting region uh, for, for a lot of, of reasons. And one of them is that we have a small country which is not part of the EU in, in the middle of our massive. So uh, today we have with us Keral Lalinde from the government of Andorra, who will talk to us, uh, who will ex explain a bit to us uh, what's being done in Andorra in terms of hydrogen. Welcome, Keral. Hello to everybody. Thank you uh, for your invitation. Um, I'm going to share my screen. You can see a presentation? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. Okay, so uh, thank you for the invitation again. Uh, we are glad to be uh, here. Today we would like to, to set out our objectives and our actions in relation to the national strategy uh, developed for combating climate change and particularly related to the use of hydrogen in our country. Uh, therefore, uh, let us start the presentation, Hydrogen, a vision from Andorra, a third country inside a uh, European cross-border region. First, uh, firstly, we must highlight Andorra's climate action. These actions made by the government are carried out by the Energy and Climate Action Agency, responding to the transition policies and climate change determined by the objectives of sustainable development uh, for hydrogen related pillars as the case of the number seven affordable and clean energies number 11 sustainable communities and cities and also uh, they are two directly related to objectives number uh, 13 climate action and number 17 partnership for the core so this is also a part of our dna and here on the slide uh, we also added our broadcast channels as instagram and twitter so you can follow us um, also, we must talk about the national and the international commitment uh, to understand the present Andorra compromise. Since 2011, Andorra is part of the United uh, Nations Convention on Climate Change, and uh, since 2050, Andorra adopted the Paris Agreement incorporating as well as pointing out uh, the discarbonization of energy with uh, an international commitment to strengthen the long-term strategy for energy and climate change, thus becoming the roadmap for achieving carbon neutrality, as you can see in 2050, and also reducing 37% uh, of the greenhouse gases at 2030. Um, arriving uh, at this point with all this legal framework of the uh, law for, for promoting uh, energy transition and climate change. So this is where contacts and targets are in line with the promotion of uh, green hydrogen produced with renewable energies. 
in a national context, we have to say that the emission sector, the, the energy sector, accounts uh, for 94.1% of the total emissions, where 90% of this total energy demand is imported. Also, we have to say that uh, our 25% of the emissions are absorbed by schemes related to uh, with the law of the conservation of the natural environment, biodiversity and landscape. Uh, so the aims of the law will therefore be to increase energy sovereignty in order to increase national production and to free us from uh, international markets. Hydrogen is postulated as an energy to provide a decrease in demand for fossil fuels energy that is currently very high. So the basis of our legal uh, and strategic framework is uh, the law that we said before, which promotes uh, this energy transition with economic growth environmental sustainability, protection and information to the user, sovereignty and diversification. But we also have to highlight our long-term strategy on energy and climate change, which has five programs that we can see on the slide. With regard to hydrogen, however, we must highlight two of these uh, programs. One, number one, that it's uh, decarbonization, and number five, that it's innovation and research. But let's see them in depth. To begin with, we will talk about the first program, which has uh, two main objectives that we have to, to say now. That is sustainable mobility. Uh, prioritizing uh, non-motorized mobility and laying the ground for a transition to a low carbon transport model. And also uh, the promotion of renewable energies and high energy efficiency. So here we have that uh, this will be achieved uh, with 33% uh, of our national electricity production by 2030 and 50% by 2050, ensuring at the same time 80% of renewable energies at least. Finally, in relation with the hydrogen, we have to highlight also the activity two of this program, uh, sustainable, connected and safe mobility. With regard to public transport, distribution logistics, municipal waste collection, the construction sector or snowmobiles on the ski slopes, among other types of vehicles, it's necessary to ensure a transition to a less emitting model, which trends to be uh, zero emissions, using among other technologies that based on green hydrogen. Here we have uh, the other uh, program, the program number five, related with the innovation, research and systematic uh, observation. Here uh, we have to say that the promotion of new energies and high valuable added activities offers new opportunities for business and economic growth. Here we have an example like the application uh, MoTV that it's a sustainable mobility aggregator. Here in program five, we have to say uh, that activity 15, uh, innovation, uh, it's important and related with the hydrogen because it's necessary to develop uh, a value chain associated with the use of hydrogen or other energy sources such as synthesis gas produced from renewable energy sources as potential energy and to achieve this carbon neutrality, especially in the transport sector, but also other sectors that it's difficult to decarbonize. These firms are energy also storage, which is uh, why they can be a good choice 
for storing electricity from renewable sources, and its subsequent uh, transformation into electricity or its direct use as fuel. One platform for promoting these tests is Real Labs, and care much uh, must be taken to include real research and innovation in the, the fight against climate change. Finally, and to summarize, um, here we would like to, to explain six uh, points that we've developed. So what could hydrogen bring to Andorra? First of all, number one, uh, no limits to renewable electricity production. Production super surplus in relation to consumption for the production of green hydrogen. Number two, manage surplus of electricity production, store surplus of renewable energy production in the form of green hydrogen for our later use as direct fuel or to produce electricity. Number three, synthetic uh, natural gas, use of excess of electricity to produce a hydrogen which, uh, which combined with atmospheric CO2 generates this synthetic methane. Number four, heating in the building sector, do use or mixing with other conventional fuels to power building wheels and reduce these green em gas emissions. Number five, uh, mobility, direct use in heavy vehicles or storage in light electric vehicles and ensure an hydrogen crater in the Pyrenees passing through Andorra. And finally, number six, uh, backup uses, uses uh, backup electricity using fuel cells when power cuts. So, well, thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, it was a pleasure. And if you want uh, more information or if you want to talk directly with the director of the Energy and Climate Change Office, uh, Carles Miquel, Mr. Carles Miquel, uh, you can send an email at uh, oecc at govern.ad and um, we, can, we can put it in the chat for, for more information. Thank you very much, Geralt. A very interesting presentation. And we will move now to a little bit uh, to the north of Andorra, to the south of France, where there is a region which has been working on the file of hydrogen for a while already. And today we have with us uh, Charlie Riverol uh, from La Région Occitanie who will walk us through the regional strategy on hydrogen and some flagship projects. Bonjour, Charlene. Bonjour. Good morning, everybody. And buenos dias a todos. Uh, so I am Charlene Ribeirol. I'm a hydrogen project manager at the Texas region, as you already said. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and I first have to start to by apologize in advance because I have another meeting just after my presentation. So if you have any question, don't worry. I can ask you, we'll have my email at the end of the presentation. So sorry for that. Uh, Charlene, I will ask you if you can speak a little bit louder because I, get, I hear you very low. Okay, Thank you. I, I, have, I think I have bad sound, so I will put my hand like that. It's better? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. And you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so first, to give you some highlights about our uh, strategy. Um, so um, Occitanian region is committed on hydrogen since uh, like, uh, five years from now. Uh, so we were the, the first region in France who realized the hydrogen strategic study. Um, and after that, uh, we launched uh, in 2018 an animating tool uh, across the entire value chain, uh, which is called HIDEO, or Hydrogen Development of Scanning. And then the most important year, uh, I may say, was in 2019. Uh, where we launch, when we launched uh, our Occitanie Green Hydrogen Plan uh, with a budget of 150 million euros over 10 years. Um, and um, as well, what we are talking about here is renewable hydrogen, because for Occitanie region, has, hydrogen is, um, is integrated in the, the, our energy roadmap. 
So hydrogen is part of a global energy mix with other renewable energy, of course. Um, so you can read all the, the objectives and our main axis, but just to summarize is our strategy is based on all the value chains uh, with public funds. Uh, so from uh, renewable hydrogen production, uh, distribution for mobility and as well for end uses, uh, as uh, we are going to see a bit later. Um, and we, uh, we as, as well as support, we have action on research and training for tomorrow and more <laughs> as well today uh, needs uh, in, in, for companies' needs. Um, I didn't put anything on the slide, but I just wanted to, to mention that we are involved as well at European level uh, as member of the A3 Ballet Partnership, so the uh, European H2 Ballet Partnership, uh, as well as the uh, regional pillar of uh, Hydrogen Europe and the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance as well. Um, and just a quick word, I, I'll be present at the TNT days or what we call as well the Connecting Europe days in Lyon in France uh, by the end of June. So if you uh, plan to attend to this event, I would be happy to, to meet you there as well. Um, now I wanted to uh, present you one concrete project in the Occitania region that have an impact at European level, uh, which called a uh, Corridor H2 Occitanie project. Um, so I know, <laughs> I think we know all the, the environmental impact on road, uh, road transport and the increasing number of tracks, of course. So I won't spend too much time on that, but just a number. Uh, in Occitania region, we have uh, like 9 millions of trucks uh, crossing the region each year, which is quite a number. And we have as well um, here on the, the city called Perpignan, uh, we have a second most um, important market for fresh products. So we as well uh, are interested in few cell refrigerated trailers because we have goods coming from Morocco through Spain and as well from Italy uh, crossing the region. So to, to build this project, we uh, started in 2019 um, with a large round table around uh, French uh, regions and as well other European regions and as well private stakeholders uh, because we wanted to uh, to know better what is their ambition on hydrogen and uh, what do we need to develop a hydrogen machine station for heavy mobility. Um, so we learned that, of course, there is a huge potential for that and all the region were interested. And then, and specifically on the north to south uh, TNT network for Trans-European and Transport Network. Um, so with, after discussion with the European Commission of the European Investment Bank, uh, we decided to start this project in Occitanie then, but thinking uh, the, the, the shape of the project as a replicable project to make it possible as well in other regions and get like a hydrogen refueling station standard, standardization as well. Um, for the, so what, what is the, the project? So here you have the, the map. So Occitanie region is here in south of France. And so as you can see on the map uh, in blue, uh, is the two uh, sites production from uh, two tons a day to four tons a day. Uh, and after there is a hydrogen refueling station at um, less than five kilometers from the TNT network, which is really dedicated to heavy trucks mobility and priority. Um, and uh, about the end uses, uh, we, uh, we have already selected um, uh, transporters, um, uh, carriers uh, with uh, 35 trucks now. So they are already in our, as a partner in our project. So we are 
uh, working with them to get uh, trucks uh, as soon as possible. Because as you see uh, here, uh, the deadline for the project is uh, all this infrastructure and the trucks have to be uh, on the road by the end of 2023. Um, so we are making this uh, project uh, on, on the road. And we are as well, uh, the region is investing in 50 regional interurban buses as well. So we are the coordinator of the project and as well an, an end user. So just to, to give you an highlight on the, the funding that we get for this project, which is estimated at 110 million euros um, total, um, so we get uh, connecting uh, Europe facility uh, funds, uh, grants, sorry, uh, after answering to, to a call of 15.5 million euros. And we as well, uh, the region has a loan with the European Investment Bank of 15 million euros. So you can see that, in fact, the Occitanian region choose to be like um, a one-stop shop I may say for those uh, different kind of uh, funds to make the project happen. And we'll see, but we, uh, uh, we as well answer to the call of the Clean, uh, clean Hydrogen Partnership uh, that just uh, closed last week uh, with a consortium uh, called Launch High for Goods. So fingers crossed for that. <laughs> and just to finish, um, I want you to present to you the, the map of the, all the projects we have from now in Occitanie region. So I won't spend too much time uh, detailing all of them. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate, but I know we are a bit delayed from now. Uh, so there is already a, a, a hydrogen refueling station deployed, other ongoing projects, and I mentioned the COVID OH2 uh, distribution site on the map and um, yeah please do not hesitate if you have questions now i can stay a bit or by email after that that's not a problem thank you very much thank you very much charlene and thank all the speakers that have addressed the hydrogen topic. We will still have someone else uh, speaking specifically about hydrogen uh, in, a, in a bit. But uh, now uh, let me please uh, address the, the topic of climate change. At the working community of the pioneers, we have a tradition of more than 12 years working on climate change and that through the Pyrenean Climate Change Observatory. Um, this is an initiative of which we will learn a bit more today. Uh, thank you to three speakers who are uh, who will explain us a bit more about uh, the job they're doing. And we will then end the block with a more international perspective, thanks to uh, the participation of the Interact program. So um, Juan Terradez, who's project manager at the Pyrenean Climate Change Observatory, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Paola. Good morning. Uh, bonjour, everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is Juan Terradez and I'm a project manager of the Pyrenean Climate Change Observatory, which is an initiative of the Pyrenean Working Community. So what's the OPCC? So this is a cross-border cooperation initiative for climate action, basically, driving, the, driving by the seven uh, Pyrene uh, Pyrenean territories of France, Spain, and Andorra. So the question is why to cooperate on climate change in the Pyrenees? What's the sense? So because the Pyrenees, like all mountain regions, are particularly sensitive to the impacts of climate change. And of course, also because uh, climate change impacts, uh, affects both socioeconomic and uh, biophysical sector in a cross-cutting way, let's say. And especially because we believe that joint action are much more effective than individual or separated action or climate action. So let's say that in other words, climate impacts uh, knows no administrative borders. And we believe that cooperation is the, the key, right? So um, basically the OPCC is a cooperation network of different actors that brings or try to bring together the scientific community, the land managers of the Pyrenees, 
also policy makers and local stakeholders with the, the aim, the big aim of generating tools and initiatives that uh, uh, to, to promote climate actions in, in the Pyrenees. So today I will focus uh, on the action for the promotion of uh, enhancing multi-level governance for climate action and on the OPCC geoportal. So because later my colleagues Blas and Jordi will talk about observation and transferability actions within the OPCC, I will focus on, on these two topics. So without any doubt, the most recent milestone on uh, climate governance in the Pyrenees is the EPIC. What's the EPIC? The EPIC is a very young strategy, a cross-border strategy recently approved by the seven territories of the working community of the Pyrenees. And another question, oh, why a cross-border climate change strategy? Why if uh, the territories already are under, under, um, under a climate policies, uh, local and, uh, and also national? So because uh, the Pyrenees are particularly sensitive in a region that is shared with seven territories, and it's uh, essential to establish adaptation priorities from a cross-border approach no? or in cooperation. So on the other hand, the, the EPIC uh, allow us to focus on mountain areas, which are generally, let's say, the areas less worked or under addressed by national and regional climate policies in the different territories of the Pyrenees. So yeah, the, for all these reasons, we believe that the, the, that the EPIC... I mean, Sorry? I think Javier Navarro, please, can you speed up your microphone, please? Thank you. Um, can, can you listen to me? Okay. Yes, Javier. Can you listen, can yes, Javier, we can hear you. <laughs> However, though, we will let uh, Juan to finish uh, his presentation, if that's okay. okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, we believe that the, the EPIC is a, a strategy, it's a complementary strategy to address specific challenges of mountain areas, let's say. So the objective, the main objective of the EPIC is basically to, mo to move from the theory to the action, let's say, but under a common framework based in cooperation. And so starting with a, starting with our first operational plan no? to, to undergo the, the, the first step of the, of the strategy. This plan, this operational plan aims to implement the EPIC's priorities actions and to achieve uh, at the end, the main objective, which is to make the Pyrenees more resilient to climate change by 2050. Okay. So one of the special features, features, let's say, or characters of the strategy of this EPIC is the systemic approach. So in the EPIC, climate change challenges are not addressed in a sectoral waypoint, let's say, but instead of this, we, 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 we have a sectoral, we implemented a more systemic vision, let's say. This new approach allows us to better reflect the cross-cutting nature of climate change impacts and also to address these key issues by considering the interaction between all the sectors concerning the challenges of uh, climate change, resource, uh, water resources, etc. So the EPIC has therefore five systems, climate, namely cl climate resilience ecosystems, adapted mountain economy, population and territory and governance. And for these five systems, uh, we also define uh, 15 main challenges uh, that have been, uh, or that we want to, to, to achieve or to, to address with 38 lines of action you know, that have been uh, defined. So yeah, and to manage this epic strategy, you know, we need a powerful and adapted go governance system, right? So therefore we decide to improve or to strengthen the, the current governance scheme of the OPCC. So let's say that before the approval of the EPIC, the, of the strategy, the governance model of the OPCC was already a meeting point uh, for decision makers, representatives of the seven territories, land managers, climate change technicians with the technical committee, of course. 
and the scientific community with the coordination boards. Now, what we want to implement or we want to, com to complement this, this scheme by what we call the monitoring board. Uh, what is this monitoring board? So it's made up uh, of representatives of the opinion main stakeholders and it missions will be, it's not working <laughs> uh, right now, but it will, will be monitor and evaluate the, the EPIC implementation process itself, let's say, you know, the monitoring and uh, process basically mainly. So the EPIC was not born uh, overnight like a mushroom, but uh, it's first of all a result of 10 years of networking and followed by an intense two years participative processes process, sorry, promoted by the OPCC ADAPID, which is a Boktefa project just done last week. So this process has involved more than 600 people, both in the cooperation of the EPIC, but also in the subsequent definition of the operational plan for its implementation. And it is an operational plan with uh, around 72 priority actions to be implemented between two, uh, 2022 and 2030. So part of this operational plan will be implemented through an integrated, we hope, integrated eight years life uh, project, uh, which has been built with uh, 47 partners from both sides of the border and 10 associated partners. So yeah, what's the next step? Just cross our fingers and pray that the project will be approved. No, I'm kidding. And uh, yeah, in April, we, um, with an epic effort, we successful, successfully submitted the integrated life application form. And now we, we will probably receive the commission's communique with the results of the evaluation between June and July. So we, right now we are waiting, but in the meantime, we continue networking and looking for com complementary funding mechanisms for uh, to implement these priority actions of the EPIC and of the operational plan. So let's now talk uh, briefly about the, the OPCC Geoportal. This uh, tool or this geo, my viewer is an interactive and, uh, and a constantly updated cartographic uh, map viewer. And the add value, let's say, is that uh, this tool capitalizes case sectoral information on climate change indicators of the world uh, uh, mountain range of the mount of the world periods. Another key point of this tool is that uh, in a single open source or open code uh, tool, we are capitalizing and uh, homogenizing key information from more than uh, 14 European projects concerning different sectors. And yeah, the users can download by for free, of course, all the cartographic information, indicators, climate basis, or regionalized climate projection. So a, very, a lot, a lot of uh, a huge amount of information. They can also make uh, customized queries by selecting selecting different variables, different climate scenarios, uh, uh, time horizons, and uh, in this analysis section that is included in, the, in this tool. So yeah, I could spend the entire event talking about the map viewer, as you can see. But here I want just to briefly, quickly show you a simple a sample of the cartographic layers of this tool with case sectoral information for climate action and uh, adaptation in the previous. So as you can see in climate projection, you have uh, you can consult and download all the regionalized climate projection with Armed, Meteo France, Service Meteorology de Catalunya, a lot of uh, um, uh, agencies, meteorological agencies of the territory, or even the evaluate the, the evolution, the trends of the 13 indicators of climate extremes defined by the World Meteorological Organization, but adapted to the Pyrenees. You can also see in the flora part, the distribution of the vascular flora most vulnerable to climate change, the natural hazard section, the evolution of the, of the different floods amongst other natural hazards. Then in fauna, the detailed evolution of the of the distribution of fauna such as the Pyrenees lizard, or in the glaciers part, we can we have detailed information or, or about the evaluation, the evolution of Pyrenean glaciers from 1990 to the present. Then water resources, we, we have more than 20 layers on water resources and water use in the Pyrenees, which is 
it's, it's great, <laughs> believe me. Then a uh, recent also evolution of uh, temperatures of the pin and legs and feed box. Let's, uh, let's uh, blast Valero to talk about this. And also uh, concerning forest maps on the climate change vulnerability indicators of the 13 main species of our forest. And uh, also in the, um, I, we have a lot of information about the hydrology, the peonies with more than 200 layers with observed indicators and models or potential observed evapotranspiration trends, also projections, snow melts, average minimum and maximum river flows at the present, the past, the future with different models, different scenarios. Uh, emission scenarios and among many other key information concerning water resources, which is, which is uh, a key resource in, in the Pyrenees. And yeah, that's all I, I want to share with you. And thank you very much for inviting us. And if you have any questions, suggestion, or you need more information, information, do not hesitate to contact me or, or Paola. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much, Juan. We are clearly um, living uh, an emergency, a climate emergency situation. That's clear with the data you just showed. And we will now pass to Jordi Cunillera from the Survey Meteorologic de Catalunya, who would explain us what is the big peer and what information and what data we can, we can have there. Jordi, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you and good morning. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to show you the, the new annual bulletin on climate change in the Pyrenees. Uh, now, uh, the, the real name of, of the bulletin is Bulletin of Climate Change Indicators in the Pyrenees, it's Big Peer. And it was uh, one of the main results of uh, ADAPIR project, the POCTEFA uh, project that uh, uh, explained a little bit <laughs> Juan Terrade before me. Uh, the, the aim of, of this bulletin is uh, to inform of temporal evolution of different climate change indicators in all the Pyrenees, in all the massive not 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 in in different uh, sectors of the massive but it's uh, in, in the home mountain mm. and their impact on the main systems or sectors in this area and always using uh, updated data and uh, being useful not only for researchers or technician people but also for uh, society in general so uh, we want to show information in a simplified way, and well, yeah, I I, I will I will show you some examples. Mm. Uh, I think uh, it's very important uh, the agreement signed between uh, the working community of the Pyrenees with entities in charge of meteorological station networks in the Pyrenees. It is. Uh, the Meteorological Service of Spain, France, Andorra, Catalonia, and Basque Country. And, and, and it's important to assure the updated data. Uh, every year, we want to issue the bulletin, so we need uh, an updated data every year. Uh, and as uh, Juan Terrades mentioned before, uh, the information will be also available in a web portal with all the information, all the indicators and, and, and more, more, more explanations. Well, this is the, 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 the bulletin. And now it's, uh, you can access to, the, to this bulletin in Spanish and Catalan versions in the website of the OPCC. Uh, we are working in uh, Basque, French, and English versions, but uh, the, the project finished mm, three days ago. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we are still working on, on these uh, translations. Uh, there are different sections uh, and 
and and I want I I only want to to show you some examples of this section, not not all the bulletin. You can access you can visit the bulletin in the web page. So <laughs> it's only a, 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 some details of of the bulletin. For instance, uh, there are uh, there uh, there's an annual summary of the last year. In this case, 2020. Uh, and highlighting some mm, items, some topics. For instance, uh, 2020 was the hottest year in the Pyrenees since at least 1959. It's the beginning of our uh, observational series, observational data. And we also want to, to, to show information in a, uh, as I said before, in a simplified way, for instance, the main extreme events during this year in 2020 uh, in, a, in, a, in a map showing the, the, the storm Gloria in January or the heat wave between July and August in Southern Pyrenees mainly, or the storm Barbara in October uh, uh, with strong winds in Northern Pyrenees, or for instance, the uh, heavy rain events in December in the Atlantic Pyrenees. So it's this, this is the, the, the information you can uh, find in this, in this bulletin and talking about the, the, the annual summary. Uh, later, there's uh, uh, information about mm, some variables or some mm, the main uh, climatic variables, so temperature and precipitation. Uh, it's information in, in maps, in graphics, in tables, but uh, I want, I want to, to, to highlight some key data on climate change related to uh, temperature in the Pyrenees. Uh, the observational uh, series is from uh, 1959 to 2020. And for instance, there's a clear increase of the annual mean temperature. And in the last 62 years, the temperature increased 1.6 Celsius degrees. It's an important increase of this uh, temperature. Uh, the increase is greater in maximum temperature than in minimum temperature. Both are increasing, but maximum daily temperature is, uh, uh, has an, an, a greater increase than minimum temperature. And for instance, uh, summer is the, uh, the season with a greater increasing of temperature. And in 62 years, the temperature, the summer temperature has increased 2.3 Celsius degrees. We also calculate uh, some indices uh, related to temperature and all the indices uh, related to cold weather are decreasing and indices related to hot weather, to warm weather are increasing. No? See, this is uh, some examples of this in, in the bulletin, you, uh, you can uh, see all the indicators. Talking about precipitation, it's always uh, 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 information in, in tables, in graphics, uh, maps, etc. Uh, the behavior of uh, precipitation is not so clear as the temperature, and but we also can highlight uh, some key data related to precipitation at the Pyrenees. For instance, uh, in the last also 62 years, there's a, a decrease of the mean precipitation in the Pyrenees and a special, a special in winter. Uh, the decrease uh, obtained in winter is the, the, the greater one of the year. And uh, the temperature is, mm, the, the evolution of the temperature is uh, very similar in all the Pyrenees, but not the, the, the precipitation evolution. And it's, mm, the decrease is, or the decreasing is more important in Southern and Mediterranean Pyrenees that in Northern or Atlantic Pyrenees. And we will show you uh, a table to, to, 
to see this difference. No? There are, uh, there's information also in, in sensitive ecosystems, glaciers, how mountain lakes and ice cave, but um, Blas Barrero will explain more and more uh, these uh, systems in the next speech. So uh, the information is in the bulletin. I don't say anything else. Uh, there are uh, informations on fauna, flora, forest phenology uh, in the Pyrenees, always in the Pyrenees with different uh, areas uh, of observational uh, uh, of observational methods no? in, 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 this, in these massive mountains. And finally, uh, we thought that uh, it was interesting to, 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 to join in, in, the, in the bulletin uh, a section with interesting studies, general uh, scientific research related to climate change, of course, in the Pyrenees, and issued in, in peer review journals during last years, the last two years, maybe. You know? And another section is uh, more explained, and it is, the name is in-depth or, or something similar, no? and it's uh, to give more explanations about one of the sections, for instance, in the first number of the bulletin, there's information about forest phenology, definition, relation with climate change, methodology, methodology of observation, and, 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 and well, and, and more explanation about this topic. No? In, uh, there's also a, 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 final, a, a final section with, uh, about the bulletin or about the report with uh, the information of contact uh, people, uh, contributors, uh, financial and, and partners of the project, well, and all this kind of information. This is what you can see and, uh, at, the, at the big peer. Uh, as I said before, is it, um, you can access to this bulletin in the web uh, page of OPCC. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordi. I will share the the link to the to the OPCC website in the chat for anyone who wants to to check on this big peer. Mm -hmm. And now uh, let's talk about the impact of climate change into the cryosphere that is for us mortals uh, lakes, glaciers, and permafrost. For that, we have today uh, Blas Valero from the Pyrenean Ecology Institute. Hello, Blas. Uh Hello, let me try to share my Can you actually share my uh, screen because I don't think I can do it now. Yes, I can I can share your screen. Okay, thank you. Just a second. I mean, I, I can like share to... my screen. <laughs> Just a second. I was able to do it before, but I don't know why now it's not letting me just a second, I will, I'm opening the presentation. Okay. Sorry. Hmm. It worked before when we were just... Uh... Okay, so can you see the presentation? Mm, yes, yes, Paula. Cross-border yeah. cooperation in fairness. Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yep. Let's try and... Do you see it on full screen? No. Nope. Okay. Um. What about now? There it is. Okay, yeah. okay. You will you will give me instructions, uh, Blas, and I will. Uh, okay, I can just say right. nest, and then we continue. So let's just start with the first one. Uh, as Paul has said, thank, well, thank you, everyone, for uh, letting 
me to explain a little bit of what are the observations of the impact of climate change on the cryosphere in the Pyrenees. This is, uh, as we said, part of uh, several projects that they had been funding through the years uh, with the working community of the Pyrenees and other uh, European projects. Next one, please. And uh, so uh, we already seen Jordi tell us that something is changing in the Pyrenees, something is happening in all across all the mountains. And I would like just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's happening in the upper part in the cryosphere, that area of the mountains that is, uh, is composed of frozen water. And maybe because this is actually one of the most sensitive uh, uh, ecosystems or geosystems to climate change. Next one. The Pyrenees are a particularly interesting range uh, for three uh, aspects uh, in what we are you know, talking about the cryosphere. One is that it's located in a region with Atlantic and Mediterranean climate variability, which actually makes that we have the east, the west, the north, and the south. So it's a lot of variability within the system. The other one is that it has a very long human history. And this is important when we talk about global change of climate change. What is happening now, it also has a history and, and hysteresis of what happened in the past. We're now seeing this recent warming and socioeconomic, change, uh, socioeconomic uh, changes, but all of them have a history too. Uh, we know a lot about what's going on in the uh, in the Pyrenees now. There's a lot of monitoring. We know a lot about what's in the past, mm, but if you what we don't know, next one please, is a lot of the interactions between this, all the different geospheres in the Pyrenees uh, interact, and maybe here is where we will have some surprises uh, with all the the synergies and feedback between all the systems. Uh, next one. So talking about the cryosphere, the frozen water that we have in the Pyrenees, we have three very clear uh, indicators, uh, sentinels of what's going on. Uh, one is the alpine lakes, another one is the glaciers, another one is the, the ice caves. If we move to the first one, the alpine lakes, um, there has been quite a lot of work during the last uh, 20 years, but I think one of the interesting approach of the the working community of the Pyrenees, uh, next one, Paula, is, the, is that idea of that we have to really work as a network. It's interesting to know what's happening in each one of particular sites, but we really, we are much more powerful if we have this network of, uh, of sites, of uh, managers, of citizens, of administration. So that's what we've been trying to implement. Uh, and to do that, there is a uh, we there is an important aspect of any observation that is to do the field work to go to the field and to know exactly what's going on. Next one, please. So with uh, different you know techniques that many of them are just going to the field every summer or every winter, and many others are trying to have the right uh, equipment so it can be recorded every hour the temperature, for example, of the lakes in depth. So on every site, uh, we're trying to have this big database that is giving us a picture of what's going on in the whole Pyrenees. Uh, next one. So the first, uh, the first thing that we all know is the lakes are warming. Uh, uh, next one, please. Uh, and we know that in, during the last maybe five or six years that we have detailed hourly uh, measurements of the temperature in depth, uh, different depths in the Pyrenees. And they all show changes uh, during the uh, during the summer, particularly. Of course, the temperature at the top of the you know, at the surface of the water responds very quickly at the temperature of the atmosphere. But there is a we can also uh, see there are changes uh, in this variability within the lakes. Uh, where we were talking before that is different the northern slopes, the Atlantic versus the southern slopes. The, one, some of the lakes are warming more in winter, and others are, well, well, being less cold in winter, and others are warming more during the summer. And in, when we have a little bit of longer time series, uh, we can see that the maximum temperature during the summer has increased from the 60s and 70s to the, uh, to the last 20 years. And you may think that two degrees is not a lot, but two degrees is a huge change in the ecosystem. Uh, next one, please. Another interesting thing that we are saying is that the lakes may look the same if you go and visit them, but something is changing within the lakes. And what is changing is that uh, 
the, the watersheds of the lakes are more active. There is more sediment that is being transported from the watersheds into the, the lakes. And this is most likely due that there is a change between the type of precipitation. There is less snow, there is more late uh, uh, rain, which is, it has a, a higher power to erode the soils. So these changes in the type of precipitation has an impact in the, in the fluxes that we, we have. We have more sediment being transported into the lakes. And next one, please. We also have um, the lakes uh, that we're studying, they're all more productive because of higher temperatures than the, the period that the, the biological productivity can be achieved is, is greater. And also most likely because there is also generally more nutrients being transported to the atmosphere. So the lakes are being more productive than what they have been, you can see in this graph for the last 1000 years. Next one, please. And, um, and we're stuck in this one. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, I seem to have a problem. Uh, okay, I will try again, sorry. Yeah, I don't know why I couldn't do it myself. Okay. Sorry. Uh -huh. Sorry, there's always, um, there's always something. Yeah, there's always something happening <laughs> where live okay uh okay the next one i'm afraid we're stuck on this one <laughs> okay so um can you maybe if you exit from the uh, yes i will do that i will do that uh i'm sorry because it's not that beautiful it's okay but we can just okay well, it's not, but at least you can get a feeling of, it's not only, as I said, the, the fluxes of sediments are changing, there's an increase in productivity and the amount of carbon that is being stored in the lakes. And also the algal communities are changing. During the last 30 years, uh, this is a case with diatom, but they, what they show is that we have a different type of algal communities in many of these uh, alpine lakes that there are over 2000 meters. So. So uh, it's okay, go to the next one. Not only that, but uh, some of the most important indicators of biogeochemical cycles like nitrogen had been altered during the last 30 years. So we have, uh, and that is most likely because there's this higher global anthropogenic nitrogen input is reaching all these lakes that we consider so pristine. Next one, please. Uh, the landscape is changing. We have mm, quite a few new lakes, uh, some of them uh, since the end of the last century, but many of them during the last 30 years, we have these new small lakes that they are created uh, at the base of the, uh, of the glaciers or at the base of the snow fields. Uh, another interesting aspect of that, we can see how changes are happening in the cryosphere is the ice caves. There are caves in the Pyrenees that they, they have fossil ice like this one. And by studying them, next one please, uh, every year, what we can say is in all of them, there's a decrease in some cases like this one, so 12 centimeters per year. So the ice within those caves that they had been there for the last, uh, in some cases, 8,000 years is disappearing at that particular rate. And that's because, you know, we would take cores in the lakes, we, in, the, in the ice, we see that there's, the temperature is, is increasing within this uh, case. They're not frozen all year anymore. And of course, glaciers. And glaciers is the one that has been most uh, publicized. Uh, and if you look at the number and next one of the glaciers that we have in the, in the Pyrenees, we have more than 50 uh, in the 1800s. And now we have maybe not even 19. And the, the loss, the ice loss has been increasing during the last 30 years. This is an iconic picture, the previous one from the last uh, uh, century. The next two ones, this is Glaciar de Monte Perdido, and you can see how it's been divided nine to two. And there, every year there's a monitoring of the ice thickness, uh, uh, realizing that maybe in the last 30 years will disappear. This is interesting because if you go to the next one, the ice cores that they had been retrieved from this lake 
from this, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, glacier show that the Monte Perdido glacier was able to survive during the warmer phases of the last 10,000 years, but it will not survive this, uh, this warm phase. And this is happening everywhere in the Pyrenees. Next one, please. The study of, the, of those 20 glaciers show, next one, that everywhere the glaciers are receding, most of them uh, will disappear in the next 30 years. So the Pyrenees will be a non-glaciated mountain for our grandchildren. Uh, another uh, clear uh, indication that the, the ice is disappearing is the little places with permafrost, with this frozen soil that they had been found over 2,900 meters in the Nile, in the ice caves, are all of them um, being monitored and the temperatures are decreasing. One, even also, go to the next one, a very interesting landscape, which is this uh, rock glaciers. And what this may have an impact in the increase in rock falls, as we are seeing now uh, in some areas uh, going to the to the Anato Peak. So, as uh, some of the take-home messages from all this, prior, the cryosphere in the Pyrenees is changing. The ice is disappearing. The lake uh, regimes are changing too, uh, not only within the lake but also in the water sets. Uh, the changes during the last thirty years or forty years are larger than what we have seen in the last 200 and maybe even the last 2000. All of these uh, lakes and glaciers and permafrost are serve as an early warning system that provide a lot of uh, ways to be used for citizen science, educational and outreach opportunities. Next one. Uh, but what is next? You know, we still don't know all this uh, coupling between the climate system and all the other global change drivers. You know, we are up here for some surprises. We need longer time series and all these observation networks are quite uh, difficult to, to maintain. But uh, I think the, the working community of the Pyrenees, next one please, is, is clearly behind this strategy of that the network is more important than every site. And that's, that's what it really takes. And I, I would like to end with this uh, quote from Maria Montessori about the importance of observing and to create a next generation of, sci of scientists and of citizens that they observe the landscape like this one, a new lake being formed at the base of the Aneto Glacier and take action about what to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blas. Thank you very much. Juan, and thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, really very, very interesting presentations, which, um, which well, uh, you're speaking about, uh, as, as we were saying, a climate emergency, and it is now to us to think about which will could be the links between, between all the hydrogen presentations we have had during the morning and these facts, uh, these um, scientific facts you have just provided us. And now uh, allow me to come back to hydrogen in order to deepen into the job that is being done in the south uh, part of the Pyrenees regarding cooperation for the, for the promotion of a hydrogen economy. We have with us uh, Javier Navarro, who's general director of industries and small and medium companies. And he will speak in representation of what is called the Ebro Hydrogen Corridor. Javier, uh, are you there? Uh, we can not see you now? Yes, I am here. Um, can you see me? You, you can we, see? We cannot. We cannot. Let's... Let's yes. try. Maybe, maybe you can now. I, I see here that the the host cannot. I, I, I think you have to. I to I have I, I have changed the settings. Maybe you can. Yes, now, we now, can now, see you now. Now, now okay. Uh, Thank you, Javier. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, this one, uh, can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, we are seeing, we are seeing the general um, program image, though, not the presentation mode, as we were with Blas. Okay, I. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like. 
to thank the community or the, la comunidad de trabajo de los Pirineos, CTP, for the invitation to be here today at this high, high level event. Today I am here as vice president of the Aragon Hydrogen Foundation, and I participate on behalf of the actors that make up the Ebro Valley Hydrogen Corridor, and which I will explain later and what can you see on the screen. We, we are seeing the general vision of your presentation, the program. Okay, uh, but now I have a little travel with it. Okay. Excuse me. Mm. Excuse me. I mean, yes, I mean, do not worry. There is always something, as we were saying. Thank you. Yeah, usually, uh, maybe, maybe if you have two screens. Yes, so. yes, the same. Then, okay. Then, um, can you see the slide now? Yes, now we can. But I cannot change this slide. We we now are 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 seeing the the first slide. Mm. Can you see it? Yes, we 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 see another another kind oh. of view, but I think we can continue with this. Okay, okay. Excuse me. Don't worry. As, as you can see on the map, the four regions are aligned with the Ebro River just below the Pyrenees. Geograph geographically, we have two large port facilities: uh, Bilbao, uh, Bilbao, and Tarragon on both sides of the corridor with industrial hubs that give access to the Atlantic and Mediterranean seas. Looking at the north side, the corridor borders with France. In terms of infrastructures, uh, the Ebro, Ebro corridor is connected at European level with the 10T network and principal energy infrastructures. In the industry sector, we have an important logistic hub that's, that connects the Iberian Peninsula with Europe. It, it is in Zaragoza. There are important H2 hydrogen consumers, Petronor refinery in Bilbao and Tarragona refinery. And we have important regions, Aragona and Navarra, with a large capacity to generate renewable energy, both wind and solar. At technological level, the Hydrogen Ebro Corridor has a network of technology, innovation, and knowledge centers and pioneers in hydrogen development. For instance, the Hydrogen, uh, the Aragon Hydrogen Foundation and several very important centers in all the regions. In the institutional, fr institutional frame, there is a strong commitment on the part of the public administration of the regions to promote the decarbonization of the economy through the renewable hydrogen, hydrogen vector. The strategies of Aragon, Catalonia, Navarra, and the Basque Country see the development of the hydrogen as one of their pillars of economy recovery. With all these components, the Ebro Corridor acquires a dimension of relevance as an ecosystem equivalent to the great European hydrogen valleys, being the most relevant corridor at a state level. Among other objectives, the line of action and their objectives for the year 2030 are listed on this slide. First, uh, 
renewable hydrogen production, installing 400 megawatts of, of hydrogen production in 2025 and 1.5 gigawatts in 2030. Secondly, to promote 1.5 gigawatts of renewable generation by 2025 and 6 gigawatts by 2030. Third, this means having a production of 250,000 tons per year of renewable hydrogen products in methanol, renewable ammonia, or synthetic fuels by 2030. And finally, the creation of one infrastructure network with 20 hydrogen stations in 2025 and 100 in 2030, having in mind land, maritime, and rail transport. In addition, to promote these lines, transversal cross-cutting activities like regulation, normative standards, knowledge management, and uh, uh, research development and innovation activities are going to be key. It's pretty important the promotion of quality employment and technological and industrial capacity. How are we going to start the corporation? A mixed commission is going to be created, including two representatives from each signatory. On April five, on April four, uh, uh, on 2022. Protocol for this cooperation was signed in Zaragoza between the four Spanish regions, Aragon, Basque Country, Catalonia, and Navarra, and signed initiative chaired by Repsol. As I said before, all signatories consider green hydrogen as a primary means for decarbonization and an opportunity for the economic and industrial reactivation of the territory through the development of the entire hydrogen techno-industrial value chain. In Aragon, of which I can go deeper, the Get Haiga initiative included is its Aragon Hydrogen Master Plan 2021 and to 2025. Our regional strategy for hydrogen constitutes an action plan for the creation of an industrial ecosystem that includes the production, transport, storage, and integration of hydrogen in industrial processes and in the different areas of energy production and consumption. The Get Haiga was signed one year ago and 83 entities signed, signed a letter of intent in Zaragoza. The Hydrogen, the Aragon Hydrogen Foundation coordinates the initiative. In the region of Catalonia, the Hydrogen Valley of Catalonia, H2 Valley Cat is uh, the reduced name, has been identified as one of the tractor projects for economic recovery for the Generalitat La Generalidad de Catalunya. Uh, the platform is promoted by institutional and business agents and are a long-term public-private cooperation model. In the region of Navarra, the Navarra Agenda for Green Hydrogen is articulated through the hydrogen table in which more than 50 companies and agents participate. The agenda constitutes a management instrument towards the development of an ecosystem uh, like the uh, Aragones ecosystem around the green hydrogen. And uh, Basque Country, in this community, the Basque Hydrogen Corridor Association, BH2C, uh, is another key project that aims to develop a renewable hydrogen ecosystem that based uh, ecosystem that based on specific projects and actions with a public private collaboration strategy allows advance in the decarbonization of the energy mobility and different 
uh, industrial sectors. The bus corridor has 61 members plus 15 in process and 12 research centers. And the fifth protagonist is not linked with a region. SHINE the, uh, uh, is the acronym of Spanish Hydrogen Network. It's a project with a comprehensive, collaborative, and multi-sectorial strategy that was born with the aim of promoting the carbonization of the economy through renewable hydrogen. This back backbone of new opportunities throughout the value chain has a national collaboration network made up of nine promoting agents and more than 75 collaborated collaborators throughout Spain. The commitment of the participating entities and the sum of their capacities and synergies and the definition of coordinated strategies will place Spain at the technological forefront as one of the powers in the renewable hydrogen economy in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Javier, for your presentation. It's truly interesting what's being done in the south of the Pyrenees regarding hydrogen development. And last, but but not least, uh, we will pass to, to a final speech by Novosha Nikolic from the Interact program, and who has several years of experience capitalizing and taking the best out of several climate change interact projects all around the European Union. In Interact, they are, they are experts in how to better disseminate what the European projects are doing in terms of climate change. The floor is yours, Novosha. I had a little trouble unmuting, but here I am. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, let me go back to my presentation for just a second. I'll be quick and efficient, I promise. So, um, in terms of motivational posters, I, I'm not a big fan, but I like this one very much. It says, work so hard that people think the aliens did it. But we also have to work smart, and that's capitalization. It's, it's part of our focus, it's part of our work. And when you use it right, it will look to the outside people like, wow, you have incredible resources or aliens helped you, but in fact, you were just working with capitalization in mind. And I will show you what I mean. A stupid project, and I intentionally use the word stupid because we have to be honest, such projects exist. Well, how I define the stupid project, I would say that it's a project with very narrow perspective. It works in isolation without regards of, of what others are doing. It builds everything from scratch, even when it's not necessary. It posts results only on the local website that nobody visits and nobody knows it exists. It only has an A3 poster on the door and it says, we have communicated about our project. We have fulfilled the requirements from the regulation and they think that's enough. They reach very few people, and after closure, they usually die. Uh, in contrast, a smart project is a project that has a broad perspective and context, works with others, uses already available resources, shares information far and wide like, like you are doing all today. It has targeted uh, information campaigns, uses social media, reaches many people, and not just in terms of quantity, but also in terms of relevance. And after closure lives on, and I like to give um, the example of OPCC and, and, and what you're doing as, as a great example of, of good projects, of projects doing capitalization. And I do, did not make this slide for this particular event. I made this slide a couple of weeks ago when I was presenting at an event of Northern Periphery in Arctic. They had the first live conference after two and a half years, and they invited a couple hundred people who are potential applicants in their first call for proposals. And so if people start reaching out to you from Northern Periphery and Arctic, people at OPCC, you can, you know, it's my fault. I really like what you're doing um, because you involve the entire region, because you do Europe-wide exchange, and today is a perfect example of this. Uh, I really love the research center you have made from the former border crossing. You 
you took something that exists in and that was abandoned and make it, you reused it for something very, very important. Presented at United Nations in New York, has have consistent social media. Uh, after closure made at least eight projects. I found eight, you probably have more. Uh, and it's not working only under one program, but uh, uh, multiple programs within Interreg and outside. So Poktefa Sudo, Alive, Horizon 2020, Erasmus Plus, and more. But to do that, you need resources. And that's the focus of my presentation today. Interact program, our program has a climate change network uh, with around 100 members from all over Europe. And we're trying to support the programs and to support the projects all over Europe dealing with the topic of climate change. And um, to support the network, we also have a set of resources that we provide to our community. And those resources are the library we have on our website. We have a very big database of projects called KEEP. And we also have a, a website that has information and more importantly, stories from different interact projects uh, from all over Europe, including on the topic of hydrogen. I've, I found a few interesting, interesting ones. We have the network that uh, meets from time to time, but at the moment is, um, is in a transition period. Uh, we are almost ready We're with our online course on capitalization. And we have this very fun uh, competition that, that uh, Paola knows very well because she participated and was the finalist, um, which I will show you as well. So now I will quickly go through each one of these and let's start for, with the library and this nice little pyramid that, that inspired my icebreaker, basically, in our library, we have a lot of uh, important uh, documents related to the topic of capitalization, but also for the topic of climate change. It has uh, a capitalization toolkit, repository of best project practices, program practices, presentations from our trainings, including on topics like storytelling, uh, videos, and more. Uh, Keep database you might be familiar with, it has uh, tens of thousands of projects and uh, I searched the other day the topic of, of hydrogen and I immediately found uh, 56 projects that you could you could check out if you're interested. Uh, on the other side, while Keep is a very formal and data-driven website on Interreg EU, we are more, more focused on stories of projects on a more approachable level stories that journalists might might be willing to share stories that could attract attention of policymakers and uh, a couple that I found uh, were from um, the Northern Periphery and Arctic program uh, from Interreg Alpine Space uh, program Northwest Europe as well and that that uh, portal might be interesting to you as well. Uh, our climate change network uh, these pictures are from a meeting we had a couple of years ago at the OPCC Climate Change Observatory. Uh, we have some very good results from the period 2014-2020, and we have plans to grow in this new current programming period 2021-2027. And our plan, one of the ideas that is still not approved but, but makes total sense, is to expand the network from uh, dealing only with climate change, but to also include... Uh, other thematic objectives from the past, because before there was 11 thematic objectives and topics like uh, green carbon economy and nature protection were separate. Uh, but in the new programming period, as you know, all of these thematic objectives are grouped under Greener Europe. So we're planning to expand our network to be not only focused on climate change, but to have all other relevant topics in the network as well to have a greener Europe network that will cover cover all of Europe. Uh, we do we have a wonderful ebook that we updated a couple of times with the best projects that we could find. We have uh, videos, uh, project visits, trainings, and we share information about all of those in our community. And more importantly, uh, one of the benefits of the network was that in addition to us meeting once or twice per year and exchanging like we do today, we also have um, access to international events and European events where we interact and the network can share results outside of our usual bubble. So we would participate at the European Green Week, but also at the United Nations uh, Climate Conference. 
Number four is our uh, online learning platform. Uh, the course on capitalization is coming very soon. In the meantime, we have a lot of short courses that are very useful for you, even if you're not a communication expert or a capitalization expert. Uh, for example, like digital storytelling, um, how to lobby for your results, and so on. How to make your writing work, communication for beginners. And finally, the last thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you is the Interact Slam. And this is basically a communication competition for all of Interreg projects. Uh, the deadline for application is Monday, 6th of June. But if you know an Interreg project that has some great results and is related to youth, uh, they could definitely apply in one day on Monday because we made the application process very, very easy. And the reason why this competition is important is because we help projects with great results have much higher visibility. And for example, last Europe, we had over 400,000 people reached by the competition. More importantly than the people reached is the number of interactions we managed to have during the social media part of the competition, which is 20, over 27,000 people, uh, 27,000 likes, shares, and comments on the, on the video stories that we posted. And uh, surprisingly, we did not have negative ones. It was all very positive and supportive. Um, of the competition. 152 competitors last year were hoping for a, a similar number this year from 20 different programs. To sum up the resources we offer to the community dealing with the topic of climate change, especially in, in Interreg, but we also like to invite people from outside of Interreg to join us at our events, is our digital library. I will share all the links in a couple of seconds in the chat. So the digital library where we have a lot of expert publications, we have a very important database of all the projects, and we also have a storytelling uh, website, interreg.eu for inspiration. We have a thematic network, which we're planning to restart and to grow in um, at the end of this year, the beginning of next, I hope. We have an online course that it's coming with a lot of practical knowledge, exa practical examples. And we have this communication competition, which uh, if you do not join as a participant, maybe you can watch the finale during the Interreg annual event. And that's basically it from my side. And I would be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Nebo. And thank you very much, everyone who is following the session, whether in Brussels or online. It's now time for questions. So if you have any question regarding anything you have heard today in this presentation, please type them in the chat so we can answer them. We will be very grateful if you could specify who would you like to answer. And please do not leave before listening to our director, Jean Vivals, who's the director of the working community of the Pioneers, and he will close this meeting today. So for the time being, I think there are no questions. So maybe Jean-Louis, uh, if you want to take the floor. Okay, okay. So, Paula, I ask you the uh, usual question today. Do you see my presentation? <laughs> not yet. No, but it's normal. I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, thank you. I would like to thank you, all the panelists and uh, all participants. And a special, uh, special thanks to Paula. Uh, we took uh, care of all of the organization of, uh, of these events and who was a brilliant uh, moderator during, during this uh, event. Uh, this two-hour session has allowed us to uh, understand that the actors of the Pyrenees and this coast are undertaking to set up large initiatives with a long-term vision on both the hydrogen and climate change which are ultimately uh, very much linked. And uh, can we imagine self-sufficient and uh, carbon neutral Pyrenean territories by uh, 2050? I think so, but this will require a close partnership between private and public stakeholders. In the first session about uh, hydrogen, we have seen the two green hydrogen corridors initiative, one on the French side 
along the motorways uh, that run east-west along the Pyrenees and bringing together the region, uh, the French region of uh, Nouvelle Aquitaine and uh, Occitanie. And one of the Spanish side along the river Ebro, bringing together the full region of Basque country, Navarra, Aragon, and Catalonia. We have now to create vertical connection between these two corridors, including Andorra, within the framework of cross-border cooperation. We have so we have we um, we have so we sorry we have also uh, seen the support of the clean the clean hydrogen uh, partnership, which is funding more than. Uh, uh, 200, uh, 280 projects for an amount of 1 billion of euros, which cover many uh, topics such as uh, uh, hydrogen valleys, hydrogen uh, and use, which is the most important topic in terms of project and funding, hydrogen storage and distribution, cross cutting, uh, hydrogen production. Uh, and just to, uh, to resume that the, for the, the next uh, call, uh, the deadline will be the 20th uh, of September. We have seen during the, this, uh, these two hours that the, the seven members of the European Community of Pyrenees has its own strategy. And uh, our, the target of our cross-border cooperation work will consist from now uh, in creating common connection. As we have done for the uh, climate change, for, for climate change by creating uh, 12 years ago the uh, Pyrenean Climate Change Observatory and by drafting an ambitious uh, Pyrenean climate change strategy. About the, uh, the Pyrenean climate change strategy, which was the topic of the second session, we have seen that more than 340 Pyrenean actors have been involved. Uh, on it. And we have been able to design a geoportal that brings together data. Uh, and it is a real uh, decision making tool uh, as a new uh, climate change policy used later can, can, uh, can be as a, an awareness uh, raising tool. We have, we have also seen that the major impact of climate change on the Pyrenean price fair with a glacier disappearing and one after the, the other, but uh, new lakes uh, appearing. That's uh, that the, uh, the impact of the uh, uh, glacier disappearing. And we have done, as we have done successfully um, with the Pyrenean Climate Change Observatory after 12 years of existence, and this is, this is better uh, a red line of the presentation and capital, capitalization uh, by Interact. Uh, I think that it is in our interest to collaborate together uh, on a long-term vision. We have to be, uh, as we have done with the uh, OPCC, the uh, cross um, road of national regional strategy. Uh, we have um, we have this uh, this capacity. We have this uh, possibility to work together uh, through the um, cooperation program, through the uh, uh, other program. So we have we have to collect all information uh, to 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 have um, to have this uh, maybe this uh, permanent hydrogen strategy. And uh, so I conclude on that and. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you again. Thank you, Paola, and uh, I'll let you the floor. Thank you very much, Jean-Louis. And thank you, everyone who, who has listened to these two hours of hydrogen and, and climate change. That's all from our side. I think there are no questions. Um, in any case, all the information and the recording of this session will be made available in the working community of the Pioneers website, and we will also send an email to all people who registered, so you can you can have the direct link. Um, that is all, and without anything else, uh, I think we can close.
Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.